Welcome back, everyone. Before we get into today's video, let me ask, are you fed up with the sanitized and exclusionary narrative that the mainstream rock press constantly force feeds you online? Are you ever wondering when you'll ever get a refreshing perspective on women throughout music history without them being referred to as mere token heroines? Are you looking for extra content where we do deep dives on lost women in music history? You can now find all of that on my Patreon. Tier 1 will grant you access to exclusive playlist recommendations and unedited episodes of my podcast where I speak to women and queer femme people about their individual experiences in the music industry. Tier 2 will get you access to exclusive patron-only video essays. And Tier 3 will grant you exclusive voting power all of my patron requested videos are guaranteed to be in the making without question. So what are you waiting for? I'm doing a giveaway as well. The first five people to pledge to my Patreon will receive a physical copy of my personal thesis on bands that shaped my life growing up. Thank you all once again for being so supportive of this channel and me on my YouTube journey. Now on with our regularly scheduled programming. The year is 1974. Britain is living through what historians describe as its darkest age since World War II. Prime Minister Edward Heath started cracking down and instituting a pay freeze for labor unions. Dock workers, postal workers, garbage collectors, and miners and electrical workers went on strike for six weeks setting off a blackout where window shops closed down, television cables were suspended, and suburban families were reduced to eating somber meals in the dark with a measly supply of borrowed candles to light their homes. As the years went on, the land of opportunity for young people in the UK seemed entirely out of reach. Racial tensions between the police and black youth only escalated, culminating in the Notting Hill Carnival riots of 1976. Women were forced to balance domestic labor and 9 to 5 jobs where they were being underpaid. And Save Your Kisses For Me by Brotherhood of Man was the number one highest selling single. Walk out the door, but I'll soon be back for more kisses for me. So it's safe to say that things were looking pretty grim and dull in Britain for the foreseeable future. That was before the giant bomb went off. This rare footage shows the Sex Pistols on stage at the Lesser Free Trade Hall. They've been booked by local student Howard Devoto, to this day a deeply enigmatic person. I'm so sorry. I'm as reluctant to acknowledge this as you probably are. But while the Sex Pistols didn't start the punk movement, they certainly set it into hyperspeed. Love them or hate them, and believe me, plenty of people did and still do for a variety of reasons. You certainly would be hard pressed to deny the fact that they spoke to a large sector of punk youth in the UK. When John Lydon cried out, no future, no future for me on God Save the Queen, that deeply resonated with his angry generation and became a sort of personal mantra which is pretty funny considering where he's ended up now, which, uh... Guess some just live long enough to become the villain, huh? The Pistols' far-reaching influence was due in no small part to their manager Malcolm McLaren, who had seen the New York Dolls in America. McLaren, enthralled with the doll's campy, lipstick-smudged tardiness, became determined to bring the punk movement across the pond with him. So he essentially found a way to repackage a revolution that was already underway in America and sell it to disaffected teenagers in the UK. Many other seminal punk groups like The Clash, The Buzzcocks, and Subway Sect all of a sudden began to surge in popularity. Enter the Slits a four-piece reggae-inspired punk band consisting of drummer Paloma McClarty, aka Palm Olive, bassist Tessa Pollitt, 
lead guitarist Viv Albertine, and frenetic frontwoman Ari Up. The slits emerged alongside the overwhelmingly testosterone-fueled machismo of the Mick Joneses and Sid Viciouses of the world, kicking the door open for legions of punk girls to follow. You don't feel any cunt. <laughs> With her ringing, soaring vocals and a presence so powerful and ridiculous at the same time, Ari Up demanded that people notice her, just by virtue of being in the same room as her. Born in Munich, West Germany in 1962, Ari Up, born Ariana Forster, was classically trained in piano and ballet at a young age. Her father was an actor and her mother was a well-connected music promoter. At the tender age of 14, Ari's mother pulled her out of boarding school in Germany and moved them into a house in the London borough of Hammersmith and Fulham that housed struggling artists. At the same time, a drummer named Paloma McClarty had decided to start a punk band of her own with all women after leaving her former band, The Flowers of Romance. And although McClarty would not end up playing on the Slit's most seminal albums, she still played a massive part in forming one of the most iconic and influential punk bands of all time. So she went to a Patti Smith show. Uh, well, maybe a Patti Smith show. She says it was Patti Smith, Ari Up says it was The Clash. But whoever was playing that night isn't exactly relevant. Anyway, McLarty was at this show where she spotted a screeching young 14-year-old yelling at her mother from across the room. And that screeching young lady was the young Ari Up. I knew I wanted a group, but I knew we needed someone with no inhibitions as a front person and I thought she definitely doesn't have inhibitions. I thought she was really funny, and I liked her. Palm Olive wasted no time, soon recruiting Kate Corris and Susie Gutsy to play on lead guitar and bass. She booked the Slit's very first rehearsal the day after the gig where she spotted Ari. They rehearsed at the place where she was squatting at the time with Joe Strummer, and as Ari recalled in an interview, my mom took me to a Clash concert. People kept saying it was a Patti Smith concert, but it wasn't. That's where I met Palm Olive. She had a little earring made out of a little pig, and she looked out of this world with her spiky hair and her motorbike boots. She just looked crazy. Palm Olive just came up to me and said, let's do an all-girl band, can you sing? Come tomorrow to rehearsal. And the slits were made the next day. It started with me singing Blitzkrieg Bop. Palm Olive had a set of songs already written. Within just a few rehearsals before the band had even played their first gig, they had already caught the attention of the influential music journalist Vivian Goldman, who covered the band in not one but two articles in News of the World and Sounds magazine, praising the group for their formidable power and attack. Goldman's article soon caught the attention of a young Tessa Pollitt, who eventually got in touch with Ari Up when Susie Gutsy stepped down as bassist. And despite the fact that she had never picked up a bass in her life, Paulet took to the instrument with swift confidence and ease, honing her own unique style of bass playing that would influence legions of DIY post-punk bands in later years. The first gig that the Slits played was on a bill with The Clash and The Buzzcocks. One of the young women in the audience that night was Viv Albertine, who was previously in another band with Palm Olive and Sid Vicious called The Flowers of Romance. She soon joined the Slits on lead guitar, replacing Kate Chorus. I was in the Flowers of Romance with Sid Vicious, and Sid left to join the Sex Pistols. I saw the Slits playing at the Roxy, and I thought they were amazing. We met up a few days later and played together, and I backcombed their hair like the New York Dolls, and that was it. We just clicked. The band had already made a big splash before setting foot in the studio. The legendary BBC DJ John Peel invited them to play one of his live sessions before they had even recorded their debut album, and Peel would go on to champion that session as one of his all-time favorites. Other influential punk women at the time, like Nina Hagen and Gina Birch from The Raincoats, became so obsessed with the slits that they tracked the band down and followed them everywhere. Birch, who was at one of the band's earliest gigs, recalled an exhilarating energy in the room as the four women played. As far as I could see, the women and the girls in the audience suddenly felt this incredible liberation 
We felt that we could do it. We hadn't had the guts to do it up until then. The slits were the first of many. They got started with very little knowledge about how to play their instruments, but that didn't deter them. In fact, I would argue that it worked as an advantage. It didn't matter that they, quote, couldn't play, as many curmudgeonly critics liked to complain, because they played in their own emotional and spontaneous ways, venturing into territories that highly trained musicians wouldn't even touch. It's not as mathematical as the boys stuff. It's more wavy, like an ocean wave, in and out, and weird chords, of course. At the time, we made song structures that no one could really fathom yet. It hadn't been put into the world. The band didn't care much for retro rock, so they had no choice but to go forward. The Clash were punk, but they had that background. Like Joe had the 101ers background. I didn't have that at all. None of us had. I grew up with flamenco music. I like African music. I had never really followed rock and roll. So even when I played the drums, I didn't like playing the hi-hat or the cymbals like normal bands did. I liked the toms much better. So I'd always experiment with those sounds more. I was curious. What had largely gotten the slits into reggae was meeting the influential DJ, owner of the Chelsea Antique Market Acme Attractions, and their eventual first manager, film director Don Letts, who was best known for his directorial work with The Clash. A friend of mine, Andrew Sazowski, opened up the very first dedicated punk rock venue, the Roxy in the West End, and asked me to DJ there. I'd never DJed in my life. And this was so early in the punk scene, there were no punk records to play. So what do I do? I play something I like. Hardcore dub reggae. Luckily, the young white potential punk rockers dug it too. So they dug the fact that it was anti-establishment, the lyrics were about something, they liked the bass lines, and they didn't mind the weed either. So there was a serious cultural exchange. Heavily inspired by the records that Don Letts played in heavy rotation at the Roxy, the slits shifted the direction of their sound from pure punk thrashers to more offbeat, bass-heavy arrangements similar to reggae. And Ari was right at home in those spaces. You get Ari to a club, and within five minutes, she is the center of attention. If there were a spotlight in the house, it would be on her. In fact, the psychological spotlight was always on her. And they weren't laughing at this crazy white woman, they were digging the fact that she knew her shit. She could outdance anybody. She's never changed, this girl. She's lived in parts of Jamaica I won't go. The band's influences were all over the place and incredibly eclectic. As Ari stated in a conversation with Pitchfork, she loved everything from reggae to disco and even musical theater, in addition to the band's clear Occidental punk influences and compadres like The Clash and The Pistols. I loved West Side Story. My mom brought home the vinyl, and my mother hated it. Ironically, she had a lot of records that she hated. Because she was so trendy, she needed to know everything there was, and she had a collection of stuff like that that she couldn't stand. But I really enjoyed the whole West Side Story thing. This is all coming into the slits. If you listen to the slits, you can hear all the influences of musicals and classical. Everything is in there that I grew up with. The Slits eventually signed to Island Records, which distributed the band's debut album, Cut. Palm Olive had departed at that point and been replaced by Budgie, who would go on to play in Susie and the Banshees. The album cover was quintessentially The Slits, embodying tribalism down to its barest bones, with Viv, Tessa, and Ari stripping down to near nudity and covering themselves in mud and loincloths. Cut was produced by legendary reggae producer and former Matumbi member Dennis Bovell, who later went on to produce critically acclaimed post-punk giants like the pop group Sada Bonaire and Orange Juice. Cut flaunted the slit's wonderfully weird range and post-punk sensibilities, blending dub reggae with anarchic punk rock, from Viv Albertine's clever postmodern feminist manifesto Typical Girls to Palm Olive's rapid-fire squatter anthem Shoplifting. Spend, Spend, Spend is a rumination on late capitalism, 
that unpacks the need that humans feel to fill an invisible void by buying products, hoping that they will somehow feel complete if they spend more money on material goods. After releasing their sophomore LP, Return of the Giant Slits, in 1981, the group disbanded and Ari retreated to Jamaica and the jungles of Belize with her children. The Slits later made a massive comeback in the late 2000s, with Anna Schult and Michelle Hill taking on the roles of drummer and guitarist. They even released a fresh new body of work in 2009 called Trapped Animal, which was just as well-rounded and defiant as their debut. Not only was the band incredibly smart and socially conscious, but they delved into these eclectic melanges of sounds that even their peers in critically acclaimed bands like The Clash would end up scrambling to catch up to them. While The Clash were the ones to be hailed as the punks who created that irresistible hybrid of punk and reggae, it was The Slits who really mixed it up. Shaking off the mantle of reggae tourists and crossing the breeds, taking the result above and beyond anything anyone had ever tried before. And the adventure had already started. The Slits were groundbreakers in every conceivable sense of the word. Their onstage antics were amazingly unhinged. The band would engage in flower-chucking fights, smash and rip apart abandoned cars, and even pee on stage if they felt like it. This was a major factor that set them apart from their glossier commercial peers like the Runaways. The Slits were never concerned about appealing to men or being viewed as attractive. If anything, they preferred it if they turned people off. And another reason why people loved them so much was that their entire output was just gay as all hell. Let's go, lesbians, let's go! I've spoken many times before about punk, the defiant attitude of the social pariah being inherently queer. And if you look at everything that the group transcended from the way that they conducted themselves and rose beyond public opposition, everything from the way Tessa Pollitt dressed to the unspoken rules of rock that they just smashed to bits every time they played. Let's just say that there are many reasons that the band has such an enormous queer following. Hell, they didn't even like the word punk. If they saw the word on a poster that they were featured on, then they would usually rip it off. In one particular interview, Palm Olive famously told journalist Chris Needs, We are not punks, we are the slits, before Ari Up promptly adds, and we make slits music. So they were outsiders even in the punk realm. And while their initial run didn't last very long, their legacy remains as potent as ever influencing a lineage that goes all the way from the raincoats to mega pop stars of the 80s like Madonna and Cyndi Lauper, all the way to the Riot Girl movement and critically lauded maverick hard rock playing punk bands today like Amel and the Sniffers. And to achieve all that the Slits were able to do without any visible role models or predecessors doing the same things took serious guts. As Ari Up so eloquently said, Fuck everything, I can't relate to anyone, no one in my family, none of my friends, none of my future, none of my past. Got no one to look up to, I'm just going to believe in me and do my own stuff and jump on the stage. And isn't that the most punk attitude of all? Long live the mighty slits.